breaking the wall of quantum life. How quantum biology lays the groundwork for organic technology. Birgitta Whaley, University of California, Berkeley. On the 9th of November 1989, I was in Berkeley watching the events in Berlin unfold on television. Nobody thought this would be possible in our lifetimes when I was growing up. It's a great ple pleasure to be with you today and to share some of the excitement that's happening currently at the wall of quantum life. And what this means is uh, it's really a wall or a barrier and indeed also a very large space between the world of quantum physics and biology. Quantum physics is something that most of us are not, don't, fe don't have a very intuitive feel for, whereas biology, we don't really normally worry about understanding biology. We, we know that we can look at it any time and we live in biology. We feel comfortable with it. We don't feel quite so comfortable with quantum phenomena. What I hope to show you is, and also to give you a bit of an insight into, is that these quantum phenomena are actually not so far away from us. And so here's a little overview of the kind of um, phenomena that currently are of interest to, uh, to people working at this interface. Um, and it ranges basically from phenomena such as uh, photosynthesis here uh, to um, bird navigation, uh, animal smells, ion channels, and even the brain. And I should say immediately that uh, a lot of the interest here has risen in recent years because of experiments and advances in technology that I'll show you on the next slide. And I will say today, mostly my, my comments in detail will be on photosynthesis because this is where we have the most evidence of quantum effects. And in these, some of these other topics, we don't have so much evidence. We have some behavioral studies on animal smell and behavioral studies with birds. Um, and with the brain, it's primarily speculation, because as you'll see, we don't have the tools yet, and you've seen the tools we do have, uh, and that's really quite a long way from the molecular level that we need to probe quantum effects. So, so this is really why this is all possible now. Um, and I, I should also add that the phenomena we're looking at are dynamic phenomena, and this is really something quite new uh, people have been looking at the interface between physics and biology for a long time, and quantum mechanics and biology, and I'll say more about that at the end. But it's really new that we can look at dynamical um, biological processes today. And really the large enablers here are really the growth of quantum information science and, uh, concomitantly, also nanotechnology. And here are just a couple of examples. For instance, from quantum information science, we have this beautiful diamond, which has a localized defect in it, an atomic scale defect. And these atomic scale defects can be activated by light, and they can be then controlled, and they reveal information about very small and very localized magnetic fields in even live biological cells. And that's really a truly spectacular advance coming out of the attempts coming indirectly out of the attempts to build quantum information processes and quantum computers over the last 15 years. And on the left, this is an advance from nanotechnology. What you see there is a live cell sort of impaled, so rather uh, it's anthropomorphically not a very pleasant situation for that cell, on top of a, um, a bed of nails, which are silicon nanorods. And the nanorods can be used to um, deliver electrical signals or biomolecules to the cell in order to study the cell's response. And on the bottom right, this is a somewhat older technology. This is technology made possible by the laser. Uh, but what we have here is very important for what I'll uh, talk about, which is an experiment involving three uh, coherent laser beams, which are interrogating uh, a sample in a coherent fashion. And this allows us to probe the dynamics of electrons in biological samples at time scales of 10 to the minus 15 uh, of seconds, that's a femtosecond, which is a truly unprecedented time scale to look at dynamics within a biological system. 
So these are the technologies which have made it possible for us to think about probing biological function now all the way from the, the length scale that we um, can see and touch, systems like the brain, all the way down, both in time scales and length spatial scales, to the regimes where we know from our understanding of physics that there will be some transition between what appears normally to us as classical behavior to quantum behaviors, and to think about um, what that really means for the biological function. So here, coming down here, so you heard this morning from Jack Gallant, the MRI machine, that sort of sits somewhere about here. And the MRI machine, by the way, that is a function of our daily life, which is, uh, involves two very uh, unusual and very important quantum processes, which by now you're probably, probably happy with MRI machines, but they're really very sophisticated um, quantum processes. One is superconductivity, and the other is nuclear spins which is a totally quantum phenomenon. But then going down further here, we're going beyond the MRI machine, we come down to the level of probing the synaptic junctions between neurons, and then down to the very molecules, uh, proteins, and uh, molecules and atoms, which make up the biological system. And then, so the physics is enabling these, um, the advances in tools that get us to ever smaller probing of the biological systems. And the Brain Initiative is a wonderful example of the effort, concerted effort to map on an ever smaller scale a very important biological system. But then coming back up in this area of quantum biology or quantum life, we're interested in understanding, taking the probes that we have here that I'll show you and bringing um, back up on this other side the information to understand how these uh, dynamics, and in this case, the coherent dynamics that we're observing, how they can be relevant for biological function. And here there is another wall, and this is in a sense a cultural wall. It's going across here from the tools, sorry, the wrong, from the tools to the function. Tool, developing the tools, in a sense, for the physicists is much easier than coming back up and discussing the function. And for this, we really need to have a cultural interchange between physicists and quantum physicists and biologists. And that's something that's definitely a work in progress. So now let me say, uh, move to photosynthesis as the example. Let me start with just pointing out a few amazing facts about photosynthesis. First is that, so as you may know, the, the primary uh, component of uh, matter that absorbs light in uh, green plants is uh, chlorophyll molecules. And this is an example of a tree, a um, beautiful painting of a tree by Picasso. And this adult tree has a total of only 140 grams of chlorophyll, typically, which has powered the entire growth of this, uh, of this tree. That's admittedly a macroscopic number of chlorophyll molecules, but in terms of mass, it's amazing that this very small amount has really made it possible for the entire tree to grow. The most important uh, key component of uh, photosynthesis in green plants is photosystem two, which part of it is shown here. And this is a, what we call a pigment protein complex. It has a lot of chlorophyll molecules which are embedded in these little curls here. And the curls, and they look like pizza, um, uh, wells, they, these are proteins which hold the chlorophylls in specific orientations. And the light is absorbed on these uh, external parts, which we call an antenna, and is absorbed by one chlorophyll molecule, and the excitation then moves from one chlorophyll molecule to another until it gets to the right part of the uh, photosystem too, where chemistry happens. I'll show you that on the next slide. I just want to also add the comment that this is a really an amazing nanomachine. The parts, there are other parts of this solar system which are not shown here, which, actually, which split water to give oxygen and uh, the hydrogen ions needed then to undergo the, the, to pump the entire system. And this also, this photosystem too has a capacity to repair itself. It actually moves physically from one region of the photosynthetic uh, membrane to another about once on, an hour on average. And those two other functions, very important functions, splitting water and um, 
repairing itself are parts that are really very poorly understood. I'm going to focus on the part of absorbing and transmitting the energy, which are the parts which are the most well understood of its function. So what's shown on the bottom left here is a, uh, is a light harvesting antenna of a bacterium, which is somewhat different in structure from the, the plant, but the principle is the same. And so the light is absorbed um, in some chlorophylls over here, and then it has to get transmitted to the reaction center over there. And if we schematically on the top, you see that the absorption now here represents schematically an excited chlorophyll molecule, which is located near or in the reaction center. At that point, the excitation breaks apart, an electron leaves, and the electron then undergoes chemical reactions, and those are the non-light parts of photosynthesis. The energy travels typically over about 30 nanometers, so it's a nanoscale process, in about one nanosecond. Now, there are two amazing things about this light harvesting. The first is that nearly all, virtually all organisms that undergo photosynthesis, whether it's plants or bacteria, have the capability, they don't always uh, activate it, but they have the capability to have near perfect, in other words, 99% efficiency of conversion of a single photon of light to an electron hole pair. Or in other words, one photon will give you one electron. This already sounds very quantum. It's also very unprecedented in biology to have something of such high efficiency. Indeed, it's also unprecedented in chemistry. In chemical reactions, you don't get this kind of efficiency. And also in physics, one's looking for, uh, it's, it's quite unusual. The second thing that's very uh, uh, unusual here is that recent experiments over the last about seven or ten years have shown that this transport process appears to have wave-like coherent energy transfer. And there's a very simple cartoon here about how the, this is enabled by, for instance, like a soccer ball moving over a rough landscape will move faster than a uh, golf ball because the golf ball might get trapped in these holes. Now, I'm going to give you a visceral, but we want to give you a visceral um, understanding of what coherence is here. And this is a, an old-fashioned uh, photograph which shows four gentlemen on a, a quadricycle. And clearly, if they don't all cycle in phase or synchronously, they will fall off. They will not be transporting themselves. More formally, we represent this as waves. And on the right, we see coherent waves which are perfectly synchronized. Whereas on the left, we have incoherent waves which uh, cancel each other out, so that effectively there's no transport of any information across there. So now I'd like to, to get, uh, to generate more of a visceral feeling for you, since quantum mechanics so is, is so unintuitive. I thought we'd like to do a little communal demonstration, a little calisthenics, to understand what a coherent wave motion is. And what we're going to do is we're going to do la ola. So we're going to start on the extreme right. I think it's Carlo is sitting here. So each of the people on the extreme right, you will start. And when I say two, one, wave, you will get up. And then the wave will proceed along from the, my right to my left. It will go to the very end. And then when it gets to the very end, I would like again the people on the extreme right to watch and then to start again. And while you're doing this, you'll be filmed, and it will be projected up here, so you'll see how coherently you can perform la ola. OK? Right. So while we'll start. One, two, wave. Again. La Ola! Great! Very good. So I hope you now all have a very good understanding of quantum physics <laughs> and, and its interplay with living objects. So, but that just gives you an idea of the coherence. Now this is a, a slide which shows the experiments. The important thing here is in these experiments of different representation, there's this second time here, there are three times between these laser pulses. The second time basically measures the amount of time the system is in the excited state. And the, if you plot the signal as a function of that second time here, you see these oscillations, which are precisely these quantum beating type of combinations of oscillations formed by adding together many different waves. And this is the evidence for the quantum coherence. 
So with this evidence, we can think of a, a number of um, applications which are actually very useful for us as, as a society. Firstly, we have here really clearly evidence for an evolved natural processor, a highly evolved natural processor, and that gives us design rules for, uh, for constructing robust quantum devices and also efficient transduction of solar energy. So here, there's a real societal need, as we all know, for um, renewable energy resources. Now, we can think about re-engineering photosynthesis. We have, uh, with the light harvesting, I said we had this amazing, close to 100% conversion of a photon to an electron. <laughs> However, we have very low energy efficiency, only 2%, and only partial use of the solar spectrum. But if we were to increase that just by a factor of five to 10% energy efficiency and use an area of the dimensions of the Mojave Desert, we'd already be getting four times the gasoline power of the US. So that's a goal for this field. And I'd like to close then with comments, historical comments. Quantum biology is actually has important forebearers from Berlin this is Max Delbruck, who was the first true quantum biologist. Yes, getting smaller, good. <laughs> Max, Max Delbruck didn't just talk about biology, he was a physicist who actually worked with biologists, and that's what we need for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you very much. <laughs>